issue, there's always winners and losers. After a intense battle for months on end, the president's going to get what he wants, and workers are going to get what they don't want. The biggest winners... Wall Street. In fact, it may be one of the biggest wins Wall Street has ever had. And it is clearly one of the biggest losses wage earners has ever taken in America. And certainly one of the biggest losses that unions will have to absorb in this country. I just want to refresh your memory. In 2012, the re-election campaign for Barack Obama was all about jobs and outsourcing. In fact, uh, The Ed Show enjoyed some of its highest ratings when we went to LaPorte, Illinois, and Lafayette, Illinois. And we did stories on the Sensata factory that was involved with Mitt Romney that was outsourced. In fact, it was the steelworkers that brought outsourcing and jobs and trade to the forefront for the Obama campaign because in 2011 they weren't very confident about how they were going to find a path to victory. Now look where the hell we are. This president is a complete turncoat on the very people that put him in office. Let me tell you what's going to come down today. It's all just about, you know, crossing the T's and dotting the I's right now. Trade Promotional Authority will get a simple vote in the Senate today. It will pass. Then there's going to be a cloture vote in the Senate today on trade adjustment assistance. That will pass. Trade adjustment assistance, of course, helps out displaced workers and helps them get back into the economy. This, of course, is something that the Democrats have said we've got to have and keep. Republicans have not been too keen on it, but it looks like they're going to hold up their word and move forward. Uh Nancy Pelosi. So this, of course, would push it all over to the House where it was supposed to get pretty interesting that there might be enough Democrats to say, no, we don't want trade promotional authority, nor do we want this lousy trade agreement. But they're caving. And the last to cave within the last hour is Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi, who previously voted against TAA, but now has said this morning that she's going to vote for it. So the Democrats, at the end of the day, are no different than the Republicans, uh, thinking that, well, the president's going to get it anyway. I might as well go ahead and vote for it, because I certainly don't want to hurt workers. This is a capitulation that the fight is over. All the bullet points that have been thrown out there about the Trans-Pacific Partnership are bullshit. And don't edit that, because that's exactly what it is. There is no where in this trade agreement where value-added tax is addressed. This country, the United States, gets killed on tariffs. 80% of what comes into this country comes in duty-free. Everything that goes out of our country gets taxed and tariffed by other countries at a torrid pace. All this talk about the customers, 95% of the customers are around the globe, and we can't miss out on that. Really? 80% of the people that live on the face of this earth live on less than $10 a day. Where are all these emerging markets? There are no emerging customers. The emerging markets is where manufacturing is going to take place, like in Vietnam, where who knows what the hell those people are going to get paid now. The United States is only one of a handful of nations worldwide that does not charge a value-added tax. 11 of the 12 countries that are involved in the Trans-Pacific Partnership do just that. This is a screw job. It's a bad deal. It's going to outsource jobs. It's going to grease the skids. It's going to depress wages in America. And it's going to be more of the same. So how do you combat it? At this point, I don't know. I really don't know. Start a new party, divide up the Democrats, get the real Democrats, and then throw the corporate Democrats, the capitulators over with the Republicans. This is a major win for Wall Street, one of the biggest wins they've ever had, because this is the largest trade agreement in the history of this country. It engulfs 40% of the gross domestic product on the face of this earth. There's nothing that could compare to it. It dwarfs 
NAFTA. This is Mitch McConnell yesterday on the Senate floor claiming victory. This is a very important day for our country. Uh, we've demonstrated we can work together on a bipartisan basis to achieve something that is extremely important for America. This is what happens when you own the Senate and the House. You can get the president to go along with you. After the vote, the courage of Bernie Sanders plays out on the Senate floor. In my view, this trade agreement will continue the policies of NAFTA, CAFTA, permanent normal trade relations with China, agreements that have cost us millions of decent paying jobs. We need a new trade policy in America, a policy that represents working families and not just the big money interest. I strongly disagree with the majority leader who called this a great day for America. It is not a great day. It's a great day for the big money interest, not a great day for working families. And the Democrats are going to go right along with it. There'll be a few who won't. Uh, this is no victory, and it's a big loss. And so the income inequality, the division in this country when it comes to income, the depression of wages, uh, the discretionary income, the discretionary spending will go south. That chart we put up, the vulture chart, it's going to get even wider. Jim Keedy is a gentleman who's running for the New Jersey Assembly in the state's 30th district. This gentleman has dedicated his life. He has been a labor rights advocacy worker with Nike workers in Indonesia for 15 years. He spent last week, the last week in May in Vietnam doing a project in uh Correlation, collaboration with uh, Senator Bernie Sanders' office, and he joins us here on the Ed Schultz Internet Broadcast. Jim, good to have you with us. It's good to be here. Put into your words what we are facing as this all unfolds by a corporate legislative body in Washington. Yeah, I think you did an excellent job in, in laying out what has happened, what's currently happening, and the direction that our country is going to go in with regard to trade. Uh, the the Trans-Pacific Partnership is just a, another extension of the trade policies of Bill Clinton. You know, we saw it with NAFTA, we saw it with CAFTA. What we're going to see is a mass dislocation of workers. Um, you know, the myth that we are sold by the market fundamentalists that these deals are good for America, they're good for American companies, they're good for American jobs, trade is good. Yes, trade is good when the rules of trade are set up to, to benefit everyone and not just a handful of people in the investing class. Uh, you know, you'd ask the question rhetorically, you know, how do, we, how do we fight this? How do we push back? And I think we saw some pushback from some members of Congress. I think many of them weren't necessarily looking at this because, you know, standing up for workers' rights and labor rights and trade deals that work for the working class and middle class, simply because it's the right thing to do, I think organized labor put, and rightfully so, uh, put a lot of pressure on them saying, you want to get reelected, you know, you better come with us in the direction we're pushing on this deal. Unfortunately, weren't, they weren't able to get enough uh, members of Congress, particularly in the Senate, to go along with them. Which is uh, a big historic. That's pretty historic right there. You have every union in this country against this entire deal. And have they lost their footing in the legislative body? And I think that this is a uh, a real benchmark moment in American legislative history. I agree. And, you know, this stuff, it, it trickles down into, um, you know, local politics as well. As you had mentioned, I'm running for the 30th district here in the state of New Jersey. Uh, there have been two Republicans uh, who are not good for labor that have been in office for a number of years. And when you look at these guys' ELEC reports, they've been getting checks cut to them by trade unions for as long as they've been in office. And, the, you know, the unions will turn around and say, well, we want to have some influence. You know, these are the the guys that we think are going to win, and, and, and I think that's part of the problem, that we need to have a much broader vision, a longer-term vision for the party. We need to be targeting people at the grassroots level who could potentially be leaders. Hey, they may lose the first time out. Uh, Abraham Lincoln lost every election that he ran in until he became president. And so th this is where organized labor and Democratic Party need to be looking at the grassroots level, investing in local campaigns, building a bullpen of people that are committed to labor rights, that are committed to social justice and the common good, that are committed to putting policies forth that are, that are going to protect and promote the working class and the middle class. And we need to do that now. And I think this has been a wake-up call. 
you know, I, certainly I'm disappointed about the loss. As you mentioned, I've been doing international labor rights work for the last 15 years of my life, actually 18 years of my life, 15 focused on Indonesia. I had gone to Vietnam. I met with the, the Nike factory workers in Vietnam. I met with the handful of people that are, you know, courageously involved in the underground independent labor movement that desperately, desperately need our help. I don't think this deal is going to help them at all to get what they want. It's certainly going to help Nike out. Uh, so but their it, lives aren't going to get any better. Those workers over there, their lives aren't going to get any better. No, I mean, right now, you know, you, you talked about the, um, one of the things that you had mentioned was one of the, the positives that the president was pushing is that this is going to open up markets for American companies, and American companies are going to be able to export. And when he was out on Nike's campus, you know, touting this deal, he had a couple of small business people from Oregon and saying that, you know, they, they'll export this many things to Vietnam and then this many to this country. It's such a small number of companies that will benefit because you take Vietnam as an example, there are 90 million people in Vietnam. The majority of them make the minimum wage or below the minimum wage, which is about $132 a month. So you have tens of millions of Vietnamese consumers who can't afford their basic needs in the local marketplace, yeah. let alone being able to afford you know, a high-end bottle of wine being exported from Oregon, as one of the examples that the president used. Well, let's let's look at this. Mr. Uh, Kearns, uh, Kevin Kearns, he is the president of the U.S. Business and Industry Council, uh, a national business organization advocating for domestic U.S. manufacturers since 1933. They've been around for a while. He points out in an article in The Hill this morning, currently the United States imposes no tariffs on roughly 80 percent of goods from uh, TPP countries. And yet, U.S. exports often run into a brick wall when trying to reach overseas consumers. For example, Vietnam slaps a 70% tariff on U.S. cars. Malaysia tax a 50% duty on U.S. motorcycles. And Japan adds 189% on U.S. shoes. So the, the the currency manipulation, the tariffs, this is a bad deal across the board. President Obama trying to double exports, he hasn't even hit 50% of that. The value-added tax, of course, is not uh, involved with uh, U.S. goods, and this stuff just drops right on our market. And so it's about manufacturing. It's not about accessing customers, as you talk about in Vietnam, who don't make any money. They're not purchasers. And this has been one of the biggest hoodwinks in the history of American government when it comes to business, as I see it. So, Jim, you do fabulous work and have a great story to tell. So, again, the lives of other people are not going to change across the globe. We're just going to be taking advantage of their cheap labor market, correct? Absolutely. I mean, if, if the president were really serious about protecting and promoting labor rights, even if you say, look, you know, globalization is here to stay. You know, trade has gone global. We've got to deal with this. And you say, all right, well, if we really are going to export our values along with our capital, before this deal got to get, before the deal got signed, before it gets finalized, we sent, I worked with the, the labor leaders and the underground democracy uh, movement in Vietnam. We, we put an eight-page letter out to the members of Congress saying, please do not sign Fast Track. Please do not support the TPP unless these things happen first. I'll give you some examples. Uh, they need, at a minimum, a million dollars in funding to help the fledgling independent trade union movement be able to do its thing. They need a commitment from the Vietnamese government that their friends and colleagues who have been jailed uh, and are sitting in prisons right now for simply exercising their fundamental rights to freely associate, that they are released immediately. They need to have an army of independent NGOs from the United States, Europe, Australia, to come in there and help to train them to be able to form the independent trade unions. Right, when I go, I, I've been doing the work in Indonesia. If I go to Indonesia tomorrow, there's 25 independent unions, 20 different NGOs that I could partner with, and we've done amazing work together. In Vietnam, there's nothing. So they are in the dark ages. They are 15 to 20 years behind the other Southeast Asian countries that have more political freedoms. And so if the Obama administration is serious about labor rights, human rights, protecting and promoting democracy, 
this stuff should have been demanded of the Vietnamese government before any deal got signed. Because after the deal gets signed, there are no penalty mechanisms in place. There are no monitoring mechanisms in place. There is no infrastructure in place to gather the data on whether these, the, the, the trade deal is, is helping workers, is helping them get better wages, is, is helping them to, uh, to have independent trade unions. You know, when the, when the president was on Nike's campus, and he's, got, and he's promoting the TPP deal and fast-track authority, and he's got the CEO from Nike sitting there, and he's saying, look, what, this deal is going to help get people better wages, and it's going to help get them independent unions. He could have and should have turned to the CEO of Nike and said, hey, Mark, Mr. Parker, you don't need this trade deal in order to do that. You have 330,000 workers in Vietnam that you're paying about $132 a month to. They don't have independent unions. They, they're... Uh, they are dealing with verbal abuse, physical abuse. Your production quotas are inhuman, and they struggle to meet them every day. They don't make enough money uh, to the point where if they have kids, their kids can't live with them. They have to send them back to a home village, and these young parents only see their children two to three times a year. Hey, Mark, fix that. You don't need a government decree or a trade deal in order to do that. Do it because it's the right thing to do, and then as the president, I might consider using my bully pulpit to get you a better deal. But the problem we have is our, our Democratic Party, along with the Republicans, both of them have been bought and sold by our transnational corporations. We have a corporate oligarchy. And I hope that this moment has awakened the base of the party, and we're starting to push. And you saw some members of Congress push back, and it's not just uh, Sherrod Brown and, and Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and the usual cast of characters. You had other people stepping up, other people fighting back, and we've got to let them know, as the base of the party, you don't fight back for the working class, for the middle class, for trade deals that benefit all Americans and small businesses. I'm a small business owner. This deal's doing nothing for me and my family. Right? If you're not going to do that, we are running you out of office. Now, the way that that is going to happen, and I'm working on it right now in the 30th district that I'm running for in New Jersey, We've got to organize, we've got to mobilize, and we've got to act. If we want big money out of politics, well, we better get a lot of small money in there. It's one of the things I'm running into right now. These two Republicans that I'm up against have a quarter of a million dollar war chest. A lot of that money has come from trade unions, unfortunately. That's what I'm fighting against. I don't want to take any big money. I want to get $25 donations, $10 donations. That's why I would encourage all your listeners Go to jimkeedy.com, J-I-M-K-E-A-D-Y.com, and, and give to the campaign. You want somebody in, in the state of New Jersey that's going to fight for working-class families and middle-class families? And how does this trade deal impact us here in New Jersey? Well, you've lost, over 200, you've, you've lost over 200,000 manufacturing jobs in New Jersey since now. Absolutely. NAFTA. And all you need to do, yeah. I live down on the beach in New Jersey. You get on the train in my town, get on the North Jersey coastline that takes you into Manhattan, and when you start getting up in, you know, in the Newark area, Jersey City area, all you got to do is look at all the bombed-out factories that are in that old manufacturing corridor. Right? It's only going to get worse if we yeah. continue to have deals that are cut like this TPP deal. And the only way that TPP deal gets cut and it gets passed and, and, and these trade, um, trade rules go into effect is if we, the people, sit back and allow our elected officials to do it. We get right. the government we deserve. Jim Keedy, always a pleasure. Great work running for the New Jersey New Jersey Assembly in uh, the state's 30th district. Has done yeoman's work when it comes to supporting workers. For the last 18 years, he's been working on advocacy rights and workers' rights in Indonesia. He knows the story about what this trade deal is all about. We'll do it again, Jim. Thanks so much. Thanks for all your right. time. Yep, you got it. This is the Etchell